object do. What can a living object do? What can a living object
animate me. Tag me. Follow me. Touch my hair. almost kissing the microphone. My thick, black, curly hair is Afro-fabulous. I stick my hair in the face of a smiling, bearded white man. Y'all have heard Don't Touch My Hair by Solange, right? Y'all have heard Don't Touch My Hair by Solange, right? Well, touch my hair. Touch it. Touch it. Go ahead. I'm bending over and crawling. I'm leaning and entering the white man's space. Go ahead. Touch it. Touch. Touch it. Touch it. Touch it. Touch it. Touch it. Sing now in the microphone. I'm pressing my body flush against his chest. You know you want to. He's laughing and screaming. Squirming. His eyes are closed. I can almost see the tears forming on the other side of his eyelids. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. You know you want to. You know you want to. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. My head is almost in his lap. His body almost vibrates from my presence. I'm crooning. Just do it. Just do it, just do it, just do it. Go ahead, just just do it, just do it. Go ahead, his hands haven't moved. <gasps> Nothing else can happen until you touch it. Do it right now. This moment illustrates one of my favorite aspects of being a black feminist performance artist <laughs> to shift the balance between what is expected of me as a plump, dark-skinned, natural-haired black woman in America and what I will actually do. gesture from puppetry to performance and design. I'm Gabrielle Seville. I'm Kelly Walters. And what we wanted to do today was just to let you into some of the conversations that we've been having over the last couple of years as members of the esteemed and amazing advisory group to the Living Objects exhibit. And to frame the things that we want to share with you today, we thought it might be helpful if we just showed you a little bit of an email that we got. Sorry. Ha! From the lovely and talented and brilliant Dr. Paulette Richards. Early on, a couple of years ago now, she sent us a really lovely email to help prepare us for the on-site advisory meeting that we would have together. 
And one of the things that she articulated in that email was the desire for us as an advisory body, but then also as a group of people building this exhibit to consider the role of African Americans in the future of puppetry. What do African American puppeteers achieve by throwing their voices into performing objects? This became one of the framing questions for both Kelly and me as we thought about what we wanted to share in terms of our own work. Gabrielle Seville is a black feminist performance artist, poet, and writer, originally from Detroit, Michigan. She has premiered 50 original performance works around the world. Her new book, Experiments in Joy, focus, focuses on black feminist solos and collaborations. A few advanced copies are on sale here. Living Objects Discount. Yes. She earned her PhD in comparative literature from NYU and teaches creative writing and critical studies at CalArts. The aim of her work is to open up space. Mm. Yeah. So I'm excited to open up a series of questions uh, for Gabrielle. And we decided a part of our format would be to ask each other a few questions and to allow that space for us to show on screen some examples of responses to those questions. And the first question or series of questions that I have are, what brought you to Living Objects? What is your relationship to African American puppetry? Can you describe how black body gesture operates in your work? And how people usually respond to your work, especially your body as a living object, as demonstrated in the beginning of this session? Great. Oh wait, let me take the mic. Just, oh, I know yeah. some people Go for it. might have some hearing accessibility issues and you don't have to tell the world that. I'm just gonna try to amplify for you. So those are great questions, Kelly, and I think um, I wanted to begin with this image, which is one of my favorite images, because it really speaks to how I first came to puppetry. So I'm really like a child of the Henson puppet world in the sense that my first exposures to puppetry were definitely through television, through Sesame Street and the Muppets. And I love this image because it helps me think about representations specifically of black puppets or African American puppets. But to be honest with you, the puppets I think in some sense that really impacted me the most were the Muppets. Because the Muppets were not necessarily for children, like the Muppets show. And it, it opened up a world in which adults and children, no, there were children, it was adults, it was movie stars, it was Diana Ross and Liza Minnelli, and then these creatures that were fluffy and had, could speak but weren't necessarily human, they were animals, but they didn't, they, didn't, they didn't operate the way animals did. And more than thinking of them as objects to build or make or manipulate, I thought of them as magical creatures that I wanted to be in a world with. Mm -hmm. wow. I just wanted to, I wanted to walk in the world with these creatures and whoever was affiliated with them. And so that's sort of what brought me first into a consciousness of puppetry. And then I lived in New York City in the, in the 90s and would go to puppet shows in the Lower East Side and would try to be a, be a part of small little puppet experiences. I was one half of a dancing blue deer at an event one time. And, you know, I felt so I was never a puppeteer, but I always I always identified with the world of puppetry or professed a love for puppetry. For that reason, when I heard about the possibility of um, an African American puppetry show, I was very interested, but I was specifically brought into that by this person. How many of you know this person? All right, so here we have Eric Avery, who was involved in one, if I'm not mistaken, involved in really the first 
conversations about the possibility of this exhibit, and in conversation with Valeska, in conversation with John Bell, and initially he intended to have a more and more, I guess you could say, central participating role as an advisor, potential um, contributor to the exhibit, and he ended up not being able to do it. And so he actually reached out to me as a person who might be able to add some perspective to the advisory committee. And I remember in our first conversation, I said, well, wait a minute, why? Why, I mean, I love puppets, I'm a puppet enthusiast, but if you're really talking about having a major exhibit, I would imagine that there are lots of people who could offer um, really important things based on their experience and practice in the field. And he did say, of course, you know, we have these questionnaires and we are reaching out to different people. But he said to me, I think that you could have some things to offer because of your relationship to black material culture and also your specific interest in object performance. Before I go deeper into my own work and my own interest in activating objects through performance art, I did want to lift up Eric for a second. Yes. And yes, let's take that, that clap for Eric. Yes. And also specifically read just a short bit from his paper, Thoughts on Race and Puppetry. Conversations about race can be tough. Talking about puppetry can be challenging. Acknowledging our personal, familial, and cultural traumas can be difficult. With all this in mind, why the hell would anyone want to exhibit historical and contemporary works of puppetry and object performance by artists who identify as black, African, or African American? Why bring the conversation of race to the forefront of a field that seems to not concern itself with ideas around race in general? Why ruin the fun? <laughs> this isn't, and he talks about the current moment that we're in, and we, in some sense, we're going to talk a little bit about that moment in various ways as well. But this next part, I think, is, is important to really uplift this Living Objects ex exhibition as it has materialized. He wrote way back, this isn't an exhibition intended to feed white guilt. This is not an exhibition to exalt the exquisite pain of the Negro. This is not an exhibition that aims to call racism on the field of poetry. This collection wants to understand our experience with images of blackness through the lenses of puppetry and object performance. So these were some of his early visions for what this Living Objects exhibit could be. And I feel so excited that it did materialize. And I just wanted to make sure to offer up some words in praise of him. Some specific questions that I had coming into the exhibit, and some of these definitely overlap with other questions other people have said. How does activating the object and performance art relate to puppetry? What does it mean to make something that could be purple, blue, or pink racially black? What does it mean to throw voice? So last night we saw some amazing examples of that in the ventriloquist showcase, but I think, I think in some of the work that I do, I'm interested in versions of throwing voice as well. And I'm curious to know what my understanding of that and the work that I do, how that potentially relates to what is happening in puppetry. And specifically, um, yes. Does throwing voice automatically presume appropriation, identification, or assumption of identity? And as the last panel, discussed, those things, appropriation, identification, and assumption of identity, are not automatically always the same thing. Although they can be. There can be conflation there. In the era of 45 and Black Lives Matter, what productive opportunities exist for protest or transgression in throwing voice or activating objects in puppetry or performance art? Let's see what just happened. Oh, wait, wait. Wake up! <laughs> that was just too good. I could not resist that. Okay. And then, who is a living object?
object, what is a living object, what are black puppets, who are black puppets? And I was especially interested in this question of black puppets. I did, I taught a class on black women in performance and we did a whole dossier on this Donnell Wolford affair. It was right at the time when this artist, Donnell Wolford, had been invited to present at the Whitney Biennial, except that Donnell Wolford didn't exist and it was actually a white artist named Joe Scanlon who had hired a series of African-American actresses to portray her. And so there was a question about, wait a second, what is going on here when there's this creation of this white artist, but there's an assumption of this identity, there are performances and artworks that are made in the name of this person, and in fact, some of the most prestigious places in the country are inviting this person who doesn't exist to come perform. What is happening there? And what, what is Joe Scanlon getting out of doing that? That became an interesting question that my class discussed. Huh, I know, look, you can look this up if you don't know. Uh, and then the yams got into it, I mean, it's a whole big thing. As I mentioned before, I identify as a black feminist performance artist. And those are a lot of words put together. We could spend a lot of time talking about who or what is black, and I'm thankful for the interventions that have been made at this festival symposium already, really thinking about how African American culture and identity relates to black diasporic culture and identity, and specifically Africa, and thinking about what is retained, what has been lost, what is, what is in the spirit, what is just about skin, and what is actually about inheritance, cultural or otherwise, what is constructed? I mean, so this, that's a big question. Feminism, what is the extent to which my work um, tries to be grounded in a certain consciousness and understanding of gender, gender relations, gender and power, and then this idea of performance art, which this quote will helpfully help to situate my understanding or the way that I am using performance art in this particular presentation. So this is a quote from Valerie Castle Oliver, Curator of Radical Presence, Black Performance and Contemporary Art, which is an, was an extraordinary exhibit that started first in Houston and then moved into the Studio Museum in Harlem and then came to the Walker Art Center where I got to see it. And in her introductions to the show, and this is in the catalog, she writes that performance art by black visual artists distinguishes itself by moving away from the stage and into the theater of the everyday and the ordinary. It is often temporal and engages visual elements, whether documents or objects. It is rooted in spectacle and occupies the liminal space between black eccentricity and bodacious behavior. Some of you might recognize yourself right there. That liminal space between black eccentricity and bodacious behavior, between political protest and social criticism. And she writes that however you understand it, it is undeniable that it is rooted in black cultural expression and historical lineage. So this is something that helps me um, articulate some of the values that are important in the work that I do. Here are some artists that are important for me or that help me think about especially black performance art. We have Dred Scott who's historically appropriating this look at these Memphis sanitation workers from 1967 where they had those signs, I am a man, except all of a sudden he's walking around in New York City with a sign that says, I am not a man. Here is one of my personal life heroes, Adrienne Piper. And this is an image from one of her early works in the 1970s where she was trying to understand something about subjecthood and objecthood and thinking about her own subjecthood, her own objecthood. She was walking around again in New York City. How many people in New York City are walking around with signs? Um, that's a sign on her body that said, wet paint. So what is that saying about her body? Right. <laughs> when I look at that image especially, I think about what it means to be a living object. Here are a few images where you see my interest in objects. And in the Q&A if you want to know more, this was about the earthquake in Haiti. This is about diaspora. This is um, in Ghana, I'm in the Atlantic Ocean. This is in Montreal, and I think John Bell actually saw this performance. It's in the pouring rain. Everyone else had umbrellas, but I wasn't allowed to have one. This is in Zimbabwe. 
and I'm interested in using objects to activate exchange with the members of the audience there in Harare. Those were some of the objects that I was sort of activating and then ended up exchanging. And then this is an image, um, this was a piece that I was working with with ancestors and trying to think about like who is sitting with us. The chair maybe looks empty, but is it really? And so there were different sets of things that I did with that chair. Now, in answer to I think it was your last question, Kelly, in terms of how my work is received, I'm just curious, and again, we've structured this with the hope that there will be time to have conversation near the end, but does anyone have any words, just, just words, one word to throw out about your own response to, to my action that happened, my tiny little action that happened at the beginning of our session. Any words of response that you had about that? Hey. Okay, what else? Creative. Confrontation, what was another word? Creative. Creative. Uncertain. Uncertain. Power. Power. Heart racing. Heart racing. Um, cool. What I'm interested in is the range of responses often that seems to emerge when I, as a black feminist performance artist, enter into a space and start to, again, try to break the frame of what is actually expected. So here we're at this conference and we're used to just sitting and like maybe listening and, and then all of a sudden it looks like maybe Kelly and I are gonna do that, but then that's not what we do. And so flip the, script. the different would you say? I said flip the script. Flip the script <laughs> break the frame. So um, I'm interested in that and I'm interested in the the range of responses actually to that, especially depending upon one's social location and the context in which the action is happening. I'm just gonna end my presentation by showing you a series of slides from one performance that I did that I think is actually related specifically to living objects and also connects to audience response in that I lived for a year and a half in Mexico City where I had a substantial project to make black feminist performance art there and I started to notice in different places the appearance of this doll and I was very interested in the circulation of blackness in Mexico and in the way that that blackness was materialized into objects and also how I was in a different place with a different cultural significance and didn't necessarily know what this object meant in that place. So I made a performance ritual to find out and it was called Nuño Fantasia de la Negrita. La Negrita. It started with a rum ritual. And before you entered into the space, you were invited if you were interested in having a little sip of rum. I did start actually with a libation as well. And then we, get in, we got into that. Came into the space. got into rum and coffee specifically and thinking about some of those products that were so important in terms of the movement of black bodies across the Americas. And then I became the doll. Double consciousness. And I played music from La Costa Chica. I had created this whole slideshow of the doll kind of coming into this wilderness of imagination and possibility. But then I also just started to move through the space and play both with some stereotypical gestures and images that I felt were associated with the doll in terms of servitude, but then also comfort. But more than whatever it was I was doing, what struck me in terms of audience response, when I put that dress on, you could have heard a pin drop in that room. And I have to tell you, I'm not quite sure I even knew the extent to which what I was doing was impacting those people in the audience. Because they were not used to people confronting race the way I was so directly, or to thinking about me as a person in conjunction with an image like that. 
So I just like became that image and then started to activate it and dance to music that was sort of black music from Mexico. And I went into the audience, which I always love to do, and started to you know, mess with the people. And, and it became a really interesting piece, thinking about how performance art can help think differently about objects in a space and the way that objects embody people and also how we can embody objects. And thinking back again to Adrienne Piper, if anyone ever wants to talk more about her, the way that one can claim one's objecthood in order to release and liberate one's subjecthood. So I'm gonna stop there, thank you so much. <laughs> Kelly Walters is a designer, educator, researcher inspired by mainstream visual culture. She holds an MFA in graphic design from the Rhode Island School of Design, a BFA in communication design, and a BA in communication sciences from the University of where? Connecticut! She is the founder of Bright Polka Dot, an interdisciplinary design practice which focuses on print, digital exhibition, and textile design. Her research investigates how social political frameworks and shifting technology influence the sounds, symbols, and styles of black cultural vernacular. She is an assistant professor of communication design in Parsons School of Design at the New School in New York. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm also very excited to share uh, a range of the work that I'm doing or have done. Uh, I think to provide some context, I see myself as an artist and a designer, or both, or educator, researcher, as listed. And much of my research uh, looks really at black culture. And specifically, I've been looking at African-American mainstream media as a source of inspiration to unpack, or even to provide a social critique on what I've experienced or what others have experienced as well. And the arc of what I'll show uh, over the next few slides is a combination of exhibition design work that I've done. Uh, I will talk specifically about this exhibition, Living Objects, which I worked uh, collaboratively with to cure, uh, not curate, but to help uh, sort of facilitate some of the design elements that are featured throughout the show. And also just talk a little bit about some of the projects that I'm doing or have done um, that look at black identity and specifically black women and how we are used as objects um, and how, again, some of the connection that I see between Gabrielle's work and my own, um, you'll see kind of evident throughout this, this presentation. So the first uh, series of images are from an exhibition that I designed called The Black Woman is God, Reprogramming the God Code. And this was for the Soma Arts Cultural Center in San Francisco. And it was an opportunity for me to work in collaboration with two curators uh, around, again, an exhibition that featured all work from black women and all from within the Bay Area. And for me, I, I'm often looking at typography, I'm looking at images, I'm looking at reference, I'm looking historically back uh, to archival material to help me decide what makes sense or to be in conversation with collaborators about what makes sense in the designs that I create. And so this one was from 2016. And then just last year, uh, this is another image of that. I worked on this for the last three years, but this one, particularly the pink and the blue, uh, is from this past uh, 2018 iteration of the exhibition. And for me, it's important to think about how do I activate other forms of design that move beyond the stereotypes of what color palettes we should be using, or what types of typography we should be using? Because what's, what happens a lot for designers that are not, that are not thinking about uh, the, the meaning behind uh, the elements that they're grabbing, just pulling things from random sources, we're not thinking about the implication of what that means over a longer term sense. So I find that it's important to know who was the type designer that created that typeface? Right. Why am I using this particular element or color? Or how does it actually relate back to the particular work that's in the show itself? And 
And again, similarly, right, the focus of this uh, session um, and also the particular uh, festival and symposium at large is looking at living objects, right? So I look back at another previous work that I worked on, and this isn't mine, but it's a sculpture by, uh, a sculpture of an African Venus. And part of the task for one of the projects that I was working on was thinking about how I could be inspired by objects within the RISD Museum. Mm. And I was limited. I had walked around, I walked around again, mm -hmm. and I was like, what here is what I'm going to be inspired by? I couldn't find anything until I stumbled upon this African Venus who was literally a foot from this white Madame Recamier sculpture. And it was in that moment that I was like, this is the reference point. These are the works that I want to be exploring and thinking about how I can be inspired by that to create a particular design piece. And so I ended up uh, thinking about other forms. So like I said, I work across medium, both digital, print, uh, textile, <coughs> experiential, environmental, but this particular piece was a poster that was really discussing the eclipse of black beauty and using these two images and dramatically treating them in a form that could speak to those things. And so, again, it, it's not that commercial piece that's selling something or for someone else. It was really for me to sort of unpack these experiences that I felt of what my identity is or who I am. And so, as I think about other pieces, right, again, I look at reference points. I find examples and think about what they mean and or try to think about how I can be inspired by that to create something else. These two magazines are black hair care magazines. Mm -hmm. And what I was inspired by one day was this spread, which for many black women who have flipped through magazines such as this, we see this grit, all this hairstyles you could possibly have, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And the gesturing in this to me <laughs> was so powerful because you have all of these like 45 degrees angle poses, gestures, right? Mm -hmm. And the eyes are really with, with two, kind of like, ah, yes, I got my hair did, yes, I have this hair, right? So I'm inspired by that, right? And at the same time, I compare it with the experiences that I've had when people are like, how long does it take you to get your hair done? Right. Oh. Did, did your mom do that? Did you braid that? Who did that for you? Where did you go? And, or the worst case scenario is someone just reaches out and touches your hair, right? <laughs> so separate from when Gab Gabrielle actually asked someone to touch her hair, right? The visceral reaction, yeah, the visceral reaction that I had was that it was a matter of, no, I don't really want you to touch my hair, so how do I, how do I activate this in a particular design piece? I created a piece called, Can I Touch Your Hair? And I activated it within an iPad experience because that inanimate object is what I wanted you to touch, not me. So I went through this process of thinking about, you might have to, because I think the computer went to sleep. Don't just touch it. Sometimes. Yeah, I went through the he process. Wants me to touch his hair. I went through the process. Touch it. Touch it. Touch it. Touch it. Touch it. So I went through the process of curating a series of videos that really was about touch, but also about this objectivity to the black female form, our hair, our body, um, and really thinking about what it means to have a white hand interject into that space, to be around language that's uh, of that space as well, whether it's knowing that my hair is a 2B and a 1B, or uh, that I'm using jelly soft curls, or that I have, it, it done in perhaps an hour, right? So these things about time, about products, are just as much about language and the, the objects and the things that we use to create who we are. And in addition to that, right, the, the work ranges, right? So in addition to, to those questions, I often look back and forward in time. And I created a website that was about pulling artifacts from the Motown Records era and wanting to look at what that means, what it looks like typographically to pull all of these sources. What does it mean to start to move them around in an interactive space? So all of these are actually assets that with a mouse you could actually move around. And to me, it's about celebration. And granted, the Motown records, there were some other 
issues in terms of like how women were treated, I would say, in terms of, and, and so there's the aspect of it that's with a, a grain of understanding, but at the same time thinking about how these images, what they mean, what they represent, also as objects to a black community. And so with all of that, right, all of that work was helping to inform how I begin this process um, in building the sort of design elements that went into the exhibition. And part of what I did was really start from a place of thinking about my previous work, but also thinking about as a graphic designer, as someone who works in both mainstream spaces, exhibition spaces, I was thinking about what I had seen on TV, what I had seen online. And these were examples of uh, uh, puppets that I uh, uh, felt and were aware of in music, right? So this is an example of a clip from Black Street, right? Very critical period as I think about music um, in hip hop. Or in another recent example, this is from Dram. And he actually activates the use of the puppet as a simulation for himself in this particular music video. Right? <laughs> exactly. I know for time. And then <laughs> I know. And then there's like thinking about even further back, right? Uh, Penny Hardaway for Nike. And as someone who's messing with or is working on teams at larger agencies. Someone's building these, like, compositions. Someone's building these commercials. Who's on the team? And often, there are not that many people of color. There's not that many black people who are there to add a particular critical lens. And I'm fascinated by the space of the use of puppetry inside of commercial branding, right? So you have products like Nike that have done repeated examples of, of the use of puppets and celebrities like LeBron or other basketball players, other sports uh, players that get activated in this space. And the last one I'll show, this one's from Sprite. I think this was actually last year too. Um, and this is kind of more of a claymation uh, object. But I, I still think it's important too because these might be only showing up on BET, right? And or particular channels that have, in this case, families that are all, it's an all black family pretty much. So I find that interesting given the context of these really dominant brands. So as I began to think about that in relation to this exhibition, right? I, I was inspired by that, but there's so much more as we've seen out in this space beyond those commercial examples. And in addition to the conversation that had happened on the advisory board, I wanted to make sure that I was thinking through the, the construction of this form, through a non-traditional <coughs> typeface, through the use of a staff that's kind of embodying and referencing an African staff, um, and thinking about references like this that could potentially inspire, uh, but also thinking about an adaptation of a hand rod puppet um, or something that was linear in form that could actually be a symbol for, for both things. And so as a more sort of branded component, I was thinking about colors that were uh, regal, that had power, that showed leadership, that showed nobility, rich colors that could be used throughout the concept of design. And these are some of the earlier examples of mock-ups of what I was trying to do. I had many conversations with John and Emily in the back that they know very well uh, of like trying different things to see what might work. I want that doing a possible yeah. tote bag yeah. 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 to see what that would look like. <laughs> Testing it out and mocking it up to see what that experience would be like. And then literally, the, the beautiful part was installing it with Emily and the team to just really think about how the space was going to come together. And so some of these are some of the earlier mock-ups wow. and <coughs> installation of the space. And really thinking about how to elevate in a, a small area different colors that could really demonstrate different zones of the experience, right? 
And this is opening night, Paulette was speaking here uh, with John, and it's, it's exciting for me as a designer to be supporting exhibitions that work with artists of color, and specifically black artists, um, because it, I feel connected to learning more about their work and how it actually dovetails with the work that I do uh, myself. And so the other piece that I wanted to highlight, uh, Kim Katubig, I think that's her last name, right? Yeah. Yeah. She's done several other like extensions of the brand. She worked on the, uh, the Valor postcard, other print material, I believe. And so I do want to shout her out. And in terms of the website that we generated, this was a collaborative as well, and sort of early conversations that happened with, um, that happened with the digital media team. Um, with the Yukon libraries and to like actually executing this this project and so definitely there were challenges but I, I think it was an excellent uh, project for me to think about how these these objects can extend into a digital space. Does this exist? This exists. I've never seen it. This has, it has everyone seen it? No. Yes. Oh, okay. Go to the website. It, it exists. Yeah. Yeah. It should be in all of the like print publication material. Right. And. The last little bit that I'll share, um, right, right, is so there's the work that I was doing prior to the exhibition, exhibition itself, and then my ongoing research, uh, which really connects to all the conversations that have happened today, uh, just in regards to thinking about black identity, material culture, looking at references. Um, I similarly did a Google search. Mine was black reaction gif because part of what I'm looking at are animated GIFs, and as you saw in the very beginning of this session, those are things that I'm collecting. And these are the images that show up when you put in a black reaction GIF. These are the things that show up when you do white reaction GIF. <coughs> right, Snow White often, multiple times. I think Doug White from, I heard it was Breaking Bad or something like that. Very interesting sort of uh, algorithm that's at play, pulling up sort of imagery. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And as mentioned yesterday, in term, or was it yesterday? Yeah. yeah. I'm like, it's all a blur. Um, but in mentioning a uh, minstrel show and minstrelsy, again, as a graphic designer, I'm interested in poster design work that was circulating at this time. Someone created this work, right? And if you're a designer today that's not aware of this work, that's a problem because we have many ads commercial going out that doesn't even think about the fact that that potential image may look like blackface, right? So I look back at these to help support the work and the things that I'm thinking about. And the one quote that I'll pull uh, is from an article by Lauren Michelle Jackson about digital blackface. And the last bit she says is, while often associated with Jim Crow era racism, the tenets of minstrel performance remain alive today in television, movies, music, and its most advanced iteration on the internet. And I'm very much interested in the internet. Did everyone get their picture of this? Oh, sorry. No. Oh. I, yeah. see, I see the, hand, like, the cameras are coming up for that. Mm -hmm. Did we get it? Here we go. And so I'm fascinated with this. Uh, I'm fascinated with understanding what the internet um, does to these conversations, how we mediate, how a device is a mask, as Paulette mentioned earlier, like the fact that puppetry can be a way for someone to activate or embody a particular character, that for me today as someone who operates on a device like an iPhone, and for many of my peers and peers younger than me, that we are sending animated GIFs yeah. through streams that are in place of actual conversation. Right. And me many of that, like many of the animated gifts that are extreme popularity, are black reaction gifts, specifically. And so I'm looking often at like how these gestures are being activated, looking and comparing archival material to contemporary material, thinking about what does that black face mean when it's in situation to Sam Jackson. Right, and what are, what are, what am I trying to say in terms of these comments? Right, what does it mean to look back at these illustrations and think about how these are extracted for that, or vice versa? Right, or this is a, a clip from uh, Amanda Hess's article in the New York Times about how all these black reaction gifts are adapted for white emojis, mm -hmm. and it means something else, or it translates itself one more time. Right. 
or uh, Doreen St. Felix wrote an article for the New Yorker about uh, Tiffany Pollard and her use of animated gifts through uh, mainstream media as well, and her becoming basically a commodified object to be disseminated through a digital mm -hmm. means, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that mean for me? What does it mean to think about like my own identity in that context? And also the last, the very, very last example that I'll show is in reference to a clip of, I'm not going to show it just for time, but it's a clip of Don Lemon. And on the night or around the night that Trump made a comment about why are we having all these shithole people, uh, countries come here, right? I watched this episode, and in this episode, this dude right here was like, oh, I don't know, it's not, I don't know what you're talking about, there's no problem, uh, 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 right? He just kind of made up some BS mess. And Don Lemon was like, you know what? Cut this dude off the screen right now to his producers on live TV. So he was like, just cut him out, cut him out, cut him out. Uh. Like he was like too through with it. And what I found very interesting about that was the viral nature of internet memes that followed that to this series of images that compared Don Lemon in 2012 to Don Lemon in uh, 2018. And essentially, they started comparing inanimate objects to him. And there were examples of like t-shirts, t-shirts of vineyard vines and <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, yeah, Burberry salt to Laurie season salt. This to me is then him becoming an object with other inanimate objects and then viralizing it again just through an internet and digital means. And the idea that this person is different than that person right, or by dress or style, right, that that could be something else, or Abercrombie to FUBU, right, those are really fascinating to me, um, and they still are, because I'm trying to figure out what that means, and so, so with that, I, I just want to uh, say thank you again for letting me share some of this work, and we, we want about to, five minutes, for yeah, 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 session. we just want <laughs> so. to open it up <laughs> What was the yeah. first one? It, it turned into like, it's like a, rice and plantains, but then. Yeah, it's like rice and plantains. Like, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Would you mind pulling up? Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. 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 so. Casserole. Is it casserole? Casserole. Yeah. It's casserole. Yeah. It's casserole. Yeah. It's casserole. Yeah. casserole. Yeah. casserole. Yeah. To yeah. jerk chicken. Yeah. 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 Formal event is at 8.30. Oh, okay. So I bet you have more than five yeah. minutes if you want to, yeah. to talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I know that you all have been through a lot of very intense things, so yes. we want to be respectful of your time. But just before we convened, we showed some things, and even before maybe if there are any individual questions, I was like, just turn to your neighbor and say one thing that struck you about anything that happened in our session at all. Just turn to your neighbor. Oh, specifically to make Black Feminist Performance Art in Mexico. 
And because of that, I, I was affiliated with a contemporary art museum that connected me with other artists. And one of the artists there said that she knew an incredible tailor. And what happened, and this was a really different experience, the tailor came to my house, she and her partner, and they brought, I showed them the doll, and then they brought samples of fabric that they thought might work, and we talked. There was actually an apron, that I don't think I ended up using the apron, but there are booties, there was a kerchief. We talked about the whole process and what it was I wanted to do. She measured me and then she made the costume. Yes. Um, more about the doll. Did you ever find out the story behind that doll? Like why it's been popping up around? Well, I heard numerous stories about that doll, but I don't know if the stories that I heard were actually true. I would say that this is another thing that's an under-researched element. Mm. So, I mean, just in thinking, and for a lot of people, at least in the audience, it was interesting because the doll, they had never thought about the doll. They recognized the doll, they knew the doll, many of them had played with the doll, but they had never thought about the doll. So it, for them, at least for my audience, and I can't speak for all you know, like Mexican yeah. people, and certainly not the afro mexican the people who really identified as Afro-Mexicans, I'm sure they had thought about the doll, so I want to be clear about that. But just in terms of the audiences that I showed this work to, that was, it seemed like a blind spot similar to what Isabella was talking about in Brazil with the monolingo puppets and then the Brazilians talking about Comedia del Arte but not really talking about Africa. I mean, that doesn't make, for when you look at them, that doesn't make any sense, but that was an experience that she as a Brazilian researcher and puppet artist was having. Are there things that struck you or questions that you have? Yes. So first of all, yeah. yeah. Days have been a whole freaking lot. I know it feels like a week, and it's only been two. This is day two. And I do paper puppets, so this is like what? So, um, one of the things I wanted to say, we were talking about the Don Lennon and how people have have um, placed him from 2012 to 2018, is that um, in my research, the relationship for slaves to slave masters is that of a child. Mm -hmm. until the child grows up. Mm -hmm. And so, for me, that means that Don Lennon at 12 <laughs> is a child, and he grew up. And mm -hmm. so there's a level of mm -hmm. disrespect or, or, or who you think you are type of mentality about that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm thinking that this is about. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, I think that's part of it. I think there's also the part of it that there's black people who perform as white people, mm -hmm. and that he all of a sudden in 2018 uh -huh. became yeah. black, right. yeah. versus right. like 2012 he wasn't black. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes through these, yes. yeah, through yes. these yes. examples of like objects that are, like the salt specifically, it's pure white to so a seasoned salt. Mm -hmm. Or like Steve Urkel wearing a particular preppy outfit mm -hmm. that would denote him being on the more quote unquote whiter side right. to like even well, Sam. Just, yeah, yeah, right. So I think that there's there's the, the child to sort of like in wise elder right kind of narrative, but I also think that there's the the performance of whiteness, and then then all of a sudden taking that cloak off, and then all of a sudden being this really like vocal black person. And I also want to know who's behind these stuff. Who's behind this, these images? I mean, I, exactly. Like, exactly. And I don't know all of them, but I'm fascinated by the saturation of them. There's so many. And this is just one example of one situation that was viralized 20 million times. And we can imagine, like, all other types of events that are specifically race driven, like, there's lots of different assets that get created. And as someone who builds assets, right, who builds JPEGs, who builds GIFs, all of these different forms that go into this space, there are people who are trained as designers making these right. graphics, and then there's non-trained designers who are everyday users who can make a GIF, or who can make an, like any kind of asset that gets sent into the mainstream portal. And Kelly, what is a GIF? And a GIF is, is yeah, I think it was, I forgot the first word. So we're looking at them, but yeah. just to say what they are. Right. It's, uh, graphic. 
graphic interchange in the format. Five format. Graphic in interchange, interchange format. format. Yeah. Like loop. Yes. Image. And so, like the very beginning of the session, there were like a series of gifts. You wanted to go back and show. Um, we can go all over. Kelly was like this playing. Is that was a gift performance that That's Kelly did, though, because with the app, the phone now as a PowerPoint remote app, she could layer them and and move the rhythm of them or subtract them. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, and so really, that's almost like turntablism, mm -hmm. except she's doing it with layered images, and they're images of black people. But also, your question around where, what is the origin, that's a very important question, I think, even in terms of puppetry, where you're dealing with a format where there are puppet characters, especially in terms of folk traditions, where who made, the, who made them? Or characters that, or puppets, objects that you encounter from a certain time, of course they were made by a person, but we don't know necessarily who that person is. So there's something interesting to me about anonymity in, re in relationship to objects. Mm -hmm. I think, again, in terms of source, like something that I'm investigating is like creating taxonomies around where these gifts are coming from. So I'm interested in specifically like there's television, there's film, and then there's reality television too, or just general news. news. Like Sweet Brown and Antoine Dotson, they came from a newscasted news. reporting right. and then became a viralized gift, which is different than like you know, Will Smith from a film, or uh, like, you know, like all of these characters from shows, either sitcoms or really prominent films. And so there's these dif different layers that I'm like fascinated by in trying to contextualize what that means. It's also interesting to me that how the digital becomes, it becomes its own context, even though it's a context that's all about being decontextualized. Mm. So that these are things, I remember the Antoine Dodson story, and that was a story about sexual assault and his sister being assaulted. But then it gets turned into something, hide your kids, hide your wife. I mean, so whatever just actually, wherever that came from, it drops out and no one even knows if that's where it came from. That's concerning to me. Or even the touch my hair thing, I mean, I can come up to this person in the front row and say that because I have a feeling she's not going to do it. And in fact, the tension of me ask that that creates a kind of discomfort there. I might not do that to someone else. It's all about context, and for me, the question of control and power. Who has control in, in the set of images like this? Who, where, how, where it happens with the power of these images as they circulate in something like the internet? That's, that's an interesting question. Just a couple more, and then I'm, I feel like we should be respectful yeah. of time. Maybe three more. Just yes. Yeah, kind of piggybacking what you just said, but with the the wet paint yeah. situation, Adrian. Uh, can you explain a little bit more on that? Because I do understand the aspect of like, um, you know, don't touch, you know, not to touch me, because I actually get that. I was just sharing just a little bit ago because I have complete strangers come and touch my hair because mm -hmm. they don't think that black people have hair as long as me for some reason. Yeah. So, like, explain more. How does that connect with, you know, living out? I think it's about thinking about her body in a way that is different from how maybe artists in her era, so this is an image from the from the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, and she was doing a series of interventions where she was moving from, let's say, painting and drawing into, into making work with her body. So then the question gets raised, like, well, what is a body? And then what happens if you feel as if there's been some problem around your body in society, and the way that your body has been seen, and the way that your body has been treated, and the way that your body has been recognized or not recognized? So wearing a sign like that, is, there is an element of don't. And to be honest, I'm so excited. I don't think I've ever even thought about it as don't touch me. It's more like calling attention to another kind of process or saying that my body, my body is a wall or my body is a surface. And it's in the process of drying or there's something both liquid and dry that's happening here. It's a different kind of body. My body is an object. And you and it's, you know what it's also really about, I'm gonna keep it real, there's about a feeling, at least in her work especially, of I've been invisible for so long, I'm gonna make myself hyper-visible to you. 
and it will be strange and you will understand it, but you fi but finally you are going to see me. And remember. And yeah. remember. Although in New York City, like some of these people are looking and some of these people don't care. So it's yeah. also it's the work that she's doing with herself, her ability to present herself in a different kind of way and explore different possibilities of what her body means. And that's very much in line with what I'm interested in doing in my work, for sure. We could talk about her more, because I love, love, love her. Was there one more? Yeah. Um, yeah, I have two questions, one for you right now. Um, the first question I had was just for you, because this is something I promote, so I wanted to know, how do you come up with the concept that the black woman is God and to reshape the black man thinking because I talked about this, I um, about the black woman being God and there's two households. There's a white household and a black household. The black household, the black woman rule, the white household, the white man rule. So I want to know how did you come up with that concept? That's my first question. So the, um, these, yeah, I'll go to these. So a couple of things. I didn't curate both of those exhibitions. Those were, these are um, by Karen Senefero and Melora Green. And it's a, an exhibition that um, part of the framing around their concept was really thinking about uh, like the black woman as, as a deity, as someone who um, like held and holds power. And I think that there were a, a cross section of artists that we're talking about very different things, whether it was sexuality, whether it was gender, whether it was just their presence and visibility through the work um, that was conveyed and showed. But I think, I imagine that for them as curators, their, their aim was really to be one of celebration. And, um, and I think that it's ran now for the last three years and have had an opportunity to work in partnership with those curators thinking about what that re-envisioning is every single time. And I think that with the very first one, I think the concept in the way that they framed reprogramming that God code, I was thinking kind of almost digital. I was thinking, thinking about uh, games and, and like old school like gaming and so what that did was sort of reinterpret the type of typeface that I might get for this form and you can see it's a little more blocky um, not to go on a side tangent but like I think that I that's what I'm interested in is like taking from or being inspired by what that curatorial statement is or saying is doing and thinking about what a visual translation of that thing may be and so in this one, um, the black woman is God for this past year, I was actually inspired by looking at um, the Black Klansman movie that just came out, right? And so part of what I wanted to draw from were like black exploitation films. So this typography and the fact that it like has dimension to it was inspired by that source. And so, uh, not that all of the objects in this exhibition were dealing with that, but that's what my, my go-to is. It's like, what is this reference? Where is it coming from? How can I adapt that? Um, and it was an exciting moment because the other part of it is like, what colors are you gonna use, right? It, it, and that's, again, as I was thinking about, you know, living objects too, that I'm interested in pushing, pushing beyond like the expected red, black, green, and thinking about other colors that we can be using. And obviously there's associations with light pink and light blue too, but I wanted to experiment with what those associations actually mean. Um, and the word is a living object. Yeah. You should talking about typeface and yeah. design. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. My next question. But first, thank you for yeah. being my puppeteer. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was an honor. It was an honor. My next question is for you. Um, I love this concept. I love, I love the whole um, brand of objects. What, ins what inspired you to actually come up with this, this, um, this project platform? Or what inspired mm -hmm. you to actually? Because this is very, very interesting. Um, I believe the black woman is God. Mm -hmm. And by me studying black women, I understand I came to the format black women were the first warriors, mm -hmm. the first rulers, and the first gods. Mm -hmm. So now, I wanted to know how did you come up with how did you come up with the 
So for me, I would say in a nutshell that my inspiration is personal and collective liberation. I'm interested in transformation and freedom. And I'm interested in shifting into a mode where it's less important how I look than how I am. I'm interested less in being seen than in doing and making. And I think I'm finally, I would say, there's something important for me that it's, I say to my students sometimes, it's, for me, it's less important to be good or right or even nice than it is to try and be free. And I'm not sure yet what that freedom is, but that's, what I'm, that's where I'm trying to get and not just by myself. I think to end, you have, we have something for you as dinner conversation. Just take a picture of some questions that you can talk with your people at dinner. I'm sorry, this is probably a faster way. No, it's great. Making it's everyone great. just do it. Great to take, just pull up, ah, pull up your camera. We just have these last few questions. Where can we find black body gesture in your own work? What are African American living objects in the 21st century? And what does it mean? And this is so central to the entire festival, symposium, exhibit. What does it mean to animate or activate objects when as a people we were once deemed living objects? Thank you all so much.